Good afternoon, folks. Tomorrow uh, will mark the sixth anniversary of a terrorist attack that killed 17 U.S. sailors aboard the USS Cole. That attack, which was really less than a year before the September 11, 2001 attacks, was a fresh demonstration to the world of the dangers that are posed by violent extremists. Those dangers would be amplified geometrically should terrorists be able to obtain weapons uh, of mass destruction. In recent days, the world's been concerned as North Korea announced a test of its nuclear capability, having previously announced that they had nuclear weapons. And we've also seen Iran continue with its nuclear program over the objections of much of the international community. Seeing Iran and North Korea on a path towards nuclear weapons brings up several issues of concern. First, those nations are known proliferators. They've proliferated to other nation states as well as to non-nation entities. We recently saw an example of the latter in the case of Iran supplying Hezbollah. Second, uh, there are Programs point to increasing risks of lethal weapons possibly ending up in the hands of non-state entities. Folks that, uh, unlike a nation, tend not to be deterred the way a nation state would because they don't have to worry about protecting real estate, population, or leadership. Another concern is that as a result of these trends, it's possible, at least, that some other nations in the world might decide that they can no longer avoid developing their own nuclear weapons. If this trend continues, there would be an increase in the number of countries with nuclear weapons, not just Iran and Korea, but possibly others. The nuclear threshold, as a result, would be lower in the years ahead. Now, none of those outcomes are in the interests of the international community. Uh, I mention that because it obviously it points up the critical importance of cooperation among the international community. Um, the task is to marshal sufficient leverage uh, so that Iran and North Korea and other countries can be dissuaded from their current course. Clearly, that's a problem that no one country is able to deal with alone, like counter-narcotics, um, proliferation. Um, it requires the cooperation of a great many countries. And this, of course, is the path that President Bush is on. Uh, it's the right course. And uh, uh, the task is to, is to marshal that support from the international community. That said, I'm very pleased to have General George Casey standing here beside me, the commanding general of the multinational force in Iraq. Uh, General Casey and I met with President Bush this morning and talked a good deal about Iraq. George, welcome to the Pentagon briefing room. I know that this is always your first choice to have an opportunity to meet with this uh, distinguished group. And uh, I want to say, as I've said to you so many times personally, how much we appreciate your very able leadership and the uh, contributions you make to a safer world. We, we value and appreciate your service. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's been about three and a half months, I think, since I've been back here, and I just wanted to give you an update of, of where I see us in the mission here and then, and then take your question. I think it's no surprise to anyone that the situation in Iraq remains difficult and complex. What makes for that uh, difficulty and complexity are a couple of things. One, uh, since the elections in December, and more particularly since the bombing of the Samar Mosque last February, we have seen the nature of the conflict evolving from an insurgency focused against us to a struggle for the division of, of political and economic power uh, among the Iraqis. Secondly, there, there are several groups that, that are working to affect that process negatively. Uh, the first, the Sunni extremists, Al-Qaeda and the Iraqis that are supporting them. Second, the Shia extremists the death squads and the more militant militias. Uh, in my view, those represent the greatest uh, current threats in Iraq. Uh, the third group is the resistance, the Sunni insurgency that sees themselves as an honorable resistance against foreign occupation in Iraq. 
And lastly, uh, the external actors, Iran and Syria. And both Iran and Syria uh, continue to be decidedly unhelpful by providing support uh, to the different uh, extremist and terrorist groups operating inside Iraq. If you add the intensities of Ramadan and the fact that the new government is just standing up, this makes for a difficult situation that's likely to remain that way for some time. That said, violence and progress coexist in Iraq, and we shouldn't be distracted uh, from the positive things that are going on there. Uh, amidst all the violence. I'll, I'll remind you that 90 percent of the violence takes place in five provinces, and those five provinces represent a little less than half of the population. And that said, while we're, we and the Iraqi government are not comfortable with the levels of sectarian violence in the center of country, we continue to move forward together there and around the rest of the country. Let me make a couple of points. First of all, the new government has been in the job a little less than 150 days. And I've, this is the third government that I've seen now take over in Iraq. And as you can imagine, it takes everyone a little, a few months there to get, get their legs under them. They're working hard to build unity, security, and prosperity for all Iraqis. And when I talk about those three priorities with the Prime Minister, he fully recognizes that if you want prosperity, you have to have security. And if you want security, you have to have unity. And he's been making a, a very significant effort on the reconciliation front. Some examples. Uh, he's been working with uh, political leaders from all the different sectarian groups on a four-point program to reduce violence in, in Baghdad. He's done that over the last week or so. Uh, last Saturday, he had a meeting with political leaders from Anbar province uh, to gain their support for government programs in, in Anbar province. He will be conducting, uh, before the end of the month, uh, the third in a series of four conferences on national dialogue and reconciliation. This one is on civil society. He's been working with political leaders uh, and our ambassador uh, to craft a political timeline to, for the, where the political leaders will agree to coming to grips with some of the more difficult issues dividing the country, the oil revenues, federalism, uh, militias, uh, th the items of those nature. And he's working uh, with the international community on building an international compact that will drive uh, investment and growth uh, for all Iraqis. All of these initiatives are going to take some time to come to fruition, but the energy and the commitment is there. Second. second we, we also continue to make progress with Iraqi security forces. Right now, we have six of the 10 Iraqi divisions, 30 of the 36 brigades, and almost 90 of the 112 Iraqi battalions in the lead. Nine months ago, for perspective, there was one division, four brigades, and 23 battalions. Now, I'd like to remind everybody of where that puts us in the overall process. The overall process of building the Iraqi security forces is a three-step process. Yeah. First step, train and equip. You, you, you organize them in, into units, you give them the individual training, and you equip them and you put them in a position where they are ready to go out and, and conduct operations. Second step, you make them better. And for the Army, that means you put them in the lead. And our th strategy is to put the Iraqis in the lead with our continued support so that they learn while doing rather than learn while watching us. And third step is you, is you make them independent. And that's what you'll see going on here over, over the better part of the next 12 months. Uh, we've said all along that we were, wanted to give the Iraqis the capability to conduct independent counterinsurgency operations, and that is the program that, that, that we are currently on. Um, I would also say that uh, we, we continue to make progress with the Ministry of Interior uh, and Police Forces. Now, the, Police have a bad reputation in Iraq, and, I, and from my view, that's, that's undeserved. Uh, broadly, it's undeserved. There are units uh, within the, within the uh, National Police Forces that, that deserve that reputation, and I think you just saw recently where one of those units was actually pulled offline by the Minister of Interior for complicity uh, in some sectarian violence. Uh, with respect to the Ministry of Interior Forces, two of the 18 Iraqi provinces now have already assumed uh, Iraqi control in their province. What that means is that the police forces in that province are capable of maintaining domestic order without routine coalition support. And in Muthana province and Dikar province, that is happening. I would expect to see six or seven, us to get to a total of about six or seven uh, Iraqi provinces under provincial Iraqi control by the end of the year. Uh, we are about 90 percent through building the 
police and border forces uh, that we said we were going to help the Iraqis build, and we expect to complete that by the end of the year. We've also, with the Iraqis, started a national police reform program where we will take a whole Iraqi National Police Brigade offline, move them to a training base, and give them three weeks of police training and uh, loyalty training uh, so that we change the, uh, not only the, uh, their abilities but the ethos of the, of the unit. Uh, that, that will go on at about one brigade a month here until it's completed in the August time frame. Uh, Finally, uh, we have, be, because our goals here are to help the Iraqis over the long term, we have instituted, helped them institute two uh, professional development courses uh, for junior and mid-level uh, officers this year, and we will put it in, help them put in place a course for senior officers and non-commissioned officers over the course of the next year. Uh, and lastly, as some of you have seen this, but the Minister of Interior himself has instituted a ministry reform program. He announced it at the Council of Representatives. He emphasizes loyalty, accountability, and operational performance. And as part of this program, uh, his Inspector General and his uh, Internal Affairs Divisions have already processed over 3,000 corruption uh, cases or investigating 3,000 corruption cases and almost 1,000 human rights cases. And he's taken action already in relieving uh, over 1,200 officers, including a, a few general officers. So lots of work to do uh, with the police and still with the Army, uh, but the progress we're seeing there is heartening. Um, now, another way to look at progress uh, to help you uh, get some perspective on this is take, is take a look at what one of our divisions accomplishes in Iraq uh, over, over the course of a, of a deployment. Uh, in this case, I'll talk about the 101st Airborne Division who was responsible for an area in northwest Iraq, was there from uh, November uh, 2005 until just this last September. Uh, over that period, uh, they, they detained over 150 high-value individuals, each one of these a painstaking intelligence collection and development effort uh, that led to, to the capture of, of an individual. They secured over 200 polling sites for the December elections and allowed 1.5 million Iraqis to vote in those provinces. They moved two Iraqi divisions, nine brigades, and 35 battalions into the lead. They brought five provincial and 11 district police headquarters up to the second highest level of preparation. They oversaw the training integration of over 32,000 police. They supported the development of two strategic infrastructure brigades with 14 battalions. They supervised the building of 100 police stations. 130 border forts and improved uh, uh, seven international ports of entry in the, along their borders. And as a result of that progress with the Iraqi security forces, they were able to reduce a two-star headquarters, two coalition brigades, a total of 10,000 coalition forces, and they closed 25 bases over the course of that time. Uh, looking back, uh, it's not insignificant what a division can get done by taking small steps every day. And that's what we say. We make progress in Iraq every day, small steps at a time. So, uh, bottom line, tough situation in Iraq, and I suspect that through Ramadan and over the next couple of months, it's going to continue to be difficult. Uh, that said, we continue to make progress across the country every day. It's tough business, but the soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines uh, of the coalition and their Iraqi colleagues are well up to the task, and they do a magnificent job under diff difficult circumstances. In closing, uh, I think it's important for the American people to know what a magnificent job uh, their servicemen and women are doing in a very, very difficult environment. And we and the Iraqis continue to move forward against very divisive forces that are trying to deny the Iraqi people the prosperous future that they so well deserve after 35 years under Saddam Hussein. And we will succeed in Iraq, it, but it will take patience and it will take will. Finally, I'd like to recognize the sacrifices of the families who've lost loved ones, and I'd like to particularly recognize the family of Lieutenant General uh, Hashemi, who was murdered yesterday. I served with him. He was the first uh, chief of the uh, Iraqi Armed Forces, served with him briefly in the early days in Baghdad. And I'd also like to recognize the families of deployed soldiers who make great sacrifices every day in support of their deployed soldiers. Both these groups are in our thoughts and prayers. Thanks very much. Thank you, General. Yes. Uh, General, uh, do you agree with the findings of a study that estimated that 655,000 Iraqis have died due to the war? And if you don't agree with that, what is your estimate? 
I, I, I have not seen the study. Uh, that 65, uh, 650,000 number seems way, way beyond any number that I have seen. I have not seen a number higher than 50,000. And so I, I, I don't give that much credibility at all. What's the 50,000 number? Where did you see that from? Uh, I, I don't remember, but I've seen it uh, over time. Is it a U.S. military estimate? Uh, I, I don't remember where I saw that. It's either from the Iraqi government or from us, but I don't remember it precisely. I think it's important to appreciate that the uh, uh, the insurgents and Al Qaeda uh, make a Muslims make a practice of killing Iraqi citizens who are Muslims, and uh, it is a uh, they do it aggressively, uh, they do it purposely, and uh, and they do it successfully. It doesn't take a genius to kill unarmed civilian people who are going to a shop or operating in a gas station or functioning in a shopping area. And uh, what we have is Muslim extremists killing Muslims and attempting to take over that country. And uh, notwithstanding the fact that over 95 percent of the Iraqi people uh, don't want that to happen. And 12 million of them went out and voted at risk to their lives so that it would not happen. Mr. Secretary? Yes. Uh, General Schoolmaker said this morning that for planning purposes, the Army is putting together troop rotations at current levels through 2010. And I realize that planning is done with a lot of uncertainty in mind. My question to you is, can you keep up that pace for that long without loosening the limitations on the use of National Guard and Reserve and without wearing out the active force? You know, I saw the Associated Press headline that said, Army, troops to stay in Iraq until 210. Uh, Schoomaker did not, of course, say anything like that. And uh, it's unfortunate that, that stories go out uh, mischaracterizing what people say. The um, Army has the responsibility at the direction of General Pace and uh, David Chu and me uh, and the President to look out over a period of time and do a series of sensitivities as to what if, what if this or what if that and how might they do it and to then undertake a planning process to see if they were asked to do this, what might they do? And that's what the Army does. The, uh, General Schoomaker and the Army does not set force levels in Iraq. They're not the ones who determine uh, how many will be there and until what year they'll be there. That's a function of General Casey and General Abizade reporting to me and to the President. But my question was, can you keep up that pace without loosening the limitations on the use of the National Guard if you were to be continuing with this current pace? I don't want to speculate. There are a variety of different things that the uh, I've received, I think, two or three of a series of six or eight briefings, ten maybe, that the Army and correction that the uh, Joint Staff has prepared, Joint Forces Command for the most part, that works with all the services. And what they're doing is looking at these various sensitivities and we're looking around corners up ahead and asking ourselves how we would do things. And there are a variety of things you can do. You can continue to do what we're doing, moving military people out of civilian posts that civilians can occupy. You can um, rearrange, uh, use the Air Force and the Navy to a greater extent than they've been used. They're, they're leaning very far forward already and uh, have done a terrific job in both Iraq and Afghanistan and in various other backup activities. Um, the, um, the options we have are, are uh, numerous, and what we have to do is decide if we were asked to do something, what might we do and, and how would we do it? Uh, until we've completed this series of, of uh, briefings and gone back and asked, answered a series of uh, a lot of questions that I ask when I get briefed, um, why we, I'm not in a position to uh, even speculate about answering your question. Nor do I think it would be useful. Yes. Uh, General Casey, um, Anthony Cordesman, in the latest of his many reports uh, on the war, um, wrote, Iraq is already in a civil war. The U.S. simply cannot wait to see if its existing strategy and actions will work. They will not. The situation is spiraling out of control, and the U.S. must either strongly reinforce its existing strategy or change it. And, and I, I want to get your response in particular Has to the civil war. Other than negative report like that? I can't think of one. 
I, I won't evaluate them. I just wanted to toss it out there and, and say, um, <laughs> given particularly the fact that you were talking about the increase in, in the need to look after the civil conflict there, whatever you want to call it, is, is, that a, is it a fair assessment at all to say that Iraq is, is currently in a civil war? I, I don't believe so, and, I, and I, I don't, the Iraqis I talk to don't believe so either. Uh, it, it, it's a difficult struggle. Uh, if you took a 30-mile radius from the center of Baghdad and, and drew a circle, 90 percent of the sectarian violence that goes on in Iraq, 80 to 90 percent, would take place in that circle, a little bit outside of that in Diyala province and, and a little bit down in Basra. So, so the idea that the country is aflame in sectarian violence is just, is just not right. So I don't subscribe to the Civil War theory. Uh, the other thing I'll say is we constantly re review our strategy and re re review what's going on, and we adapt it as we need to. And as, as you saw in, in July, uh, I was on a track to recommend uh, off-ramping a couple of brigades, and the situation on the ground didn't support that, and so I re reversed that, and we, and we kept the forces there. And so we constantly look at, at what we need, and I ask for what I need. Can I just ask you to respond generally to what Anthony Kodesman wrote there? I, I, generally, um, can you just sort of respond to the, the criticism that the U.S. needs to change its strategy? I think I just did. I, I mean, I just said we constantly look at what's going on and we adapt what we're doing to, 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 to meet the conditions on the ground. Robert? General Casey, no, going back to what you just said, that several weeks ago you made the decision not to off-ramp troops. But since that decision, in fact, all the statistics show that um, uh, fatalities for U.S. troops are on the rise. The number of wounded continues to rise. The number of attacks continue to rise. Senator Warner has now come out and expressed his concern that something now has to change in the next two to three months. So you have made that one decision, but what are you looking at now to, in terms of reviewing, changing, adapting your strategy? What's the next step? to get control on the violence, strictly from the security standpoint, not economic and political? Yeah. Um, the, the operational strategy to deal with the increases uh, in violence is, is something that I'm working very closely with, with Pete Corelli. The, the broad strategy uh, where we are working to bring the levels of insurgency down uh, as we bring Iraqi security forces up, I believe, is still a valid framework for what we're doing there in Iraq. And we will continue to look at tactically what's happening on the ground, and, and my subordinate commanders will work uh, to deal with that. But in the last six weeks, it's all gone upwards. How do you... How it, actually, do you it actually hasn't all gone upwards. There has, I think we shouldn't try to sugarcoat this. The levels of violence over the last few weeks are as high as they have been. But, but I would point that out a couple of things. One, we count that. We, we count what the enemy does for our own purposes, to, so we can make some judgments and assessments on the enemy. And then we report that, and people say that's the, that's the measure of your success. We count everything from a rifle shot to a car bomb as part of those totals. Now, we're not comfortable with the levels of sectarian violence in Baghdad. Neither is the Iraqi government. And we're working with them uh, to take measures to deal with that. The plan that we have in effect in Baghdad has affected the levels of, of sectarian violence in Baghdad, uh, not as, as, uh, as quickly as we would have liked. We, when we first started our, our program in Baghdad, we saw a sharp drop-off. Then they fought back, and now we've been fighting back, and, the, and it's going back down again. But it's still higher than we like. And this is going to be a long-term process. It's not going to be something that we're going to get done quickly. Yes. If um, the violence in Iraq is mostly confined to five provinces, why have only two provinces been turned over to Iraqi lead? And does that say the strategy of how you're pushing forward the Iraqi security forces uh, is flawed and needs to be reevaluated. No, it doesn't. First of all, we're not pushing Iraqi security forces forward. We're training them and help and preparing them to take on an independent responsibility. The provincial Iraqi control uh, contains assessments about the security situation, about the readiness of the police, their capabilities, about the readiness of the army forces in that province and provinces, and about the ability of the governor and the provincial security council leader uh, to orchestrate security operations in that province. So we, with the governors of the provinces, make assessments in each of those areas. And when they feel and we feel that they're ready, then that bubbles up and, and the re recommendation is made to the prime minister that this province transfer. So it's a pretty deliberate process and we're not pushing anybody. I 
the end of the year, how many provinces would you hope to have uh, transferred? Based on the projections that the governors are giving us now, we think, I think, six or seven. And I think you're going to see that continue in, into 2007. It should, it should be pointed out that as General Casey sets up benchmarks and, and um, targets, projections as to what he would like to accomplish, uh, he has control over a portion of it. The Iraqi government has a control over a portion of it. And the enemy has control over a portion of it. And what may very well happen is that he will make a projection and with respect to some province, it would go sooner than we projected. Some might go later. Some even might go and not work out and have to be taken back, fixed, and then given back to the Iraqis at some point. So that, that I think one ought not to think of it as a perfectly smooth, predictable path. But, but the benchmarks that are out there include the passing over of Iraqi divisions for Iraqi control in their chain of command, the passing over of provinces, the closing and the transferring of military bases. We now have gone, I think, from something like 110 down to 55. Mm -hmm. And we will continue to close or pass over military bases to the Iraqis as, as appropriate. And, and, uh, but, uh, but I want to just punctuate that because it will be a recurring theme as we go forward. So, uh, yes. Mr. Secretary, with North Korea, can there be effective diplomacy with a regime like North Korea without a strong military deterrent in effect in their faces? Well, um, I guess time will tell. I think the, the answer is uh, probably yes, but one can't be certain. Uh, I think that the president is, is clearly on the right path in, in um, marshalling other countries to support an approach to try to leverage um, the world opinion uh, to cause uh, the Korean government to change their direction. Um, it's not in, in, the, in the world community's interest to have them succeed in, in threatening the world with nuclear weapons or proliferating those technologies. The world has to understand that and see that, and that's why he has been so energetic and diligent in, in working with other countries uh, recently and, and within recent days, uh, fashioning a group to, uh, to work through the United Nations. I think that, that it is very definitely the, the proper thing to do. And uh, the, uh, there are things, non-kinetic non things, that can be done to uh, North Korea that the UN would consider and other countries are considering. Indeed, one country has already announced some steps quite apart from anything the United Nations might do. And um, as I say, non-kinetic. Uh, but uh, I, th I think the answer to your uh, question is probably yes, but one can't know that with certainty because you'd, you'd have to be able to climb inside the, the mind of the leadership in that country and, and not only just the leader, but the interaction between the leader and the small cadre of people that he may listen to. Secretary, you said sir, yeah. before North Korea conducted its test that you thought uh, we would know, the United States would know, uh, whether or not it was a nuclear uh, detonation or not. It's mm -hmm. been a couple of days now. Do you know, uh, uh, what do you think, will we ever know for sure? Um, I'm going to answer carefully because it's really, a, an, a, the intelligence community is, is doing the analysis. And they are doing it on, the, on their own hook. They're doing it in co clo reasonably close consultation with other countries that have reason to have knowledge of the subject. Um, if you think back to the Indian nuclear tests and the Pakistani nuclear tests back in the 90s, as I recall, uh, our information there was quite sparse. <laughs> uh, indeed, uh, almost non-existent in one case and very, very long in coming in another. And uh, I'm doing this from memory, but uh, I think it would be, uh, we know, we will know something. We, we, there are various factors that determine when we will know that something. It's unlikely we will know everything because it is a closed society and uh, um, it, it is absent certain kinds of intelligence. It's, it's impossible to know of certain knowledge certain things that take place in a closed society. 
But um, I think over the period ahead, the information will settle down and we'll have a better better visibility into what actually took place. At this point, do you think it was a nuclear test? I don't want to speculate. I just don't think it's useful. If I say something, um, someone will then assume that, that I had some knowledge which I don't have. I, I, I think it, it's proper to wait and let, let the sifting and the sorting go and, and the consultations with other countries and they, they triangulate and try to figure out uh, what this means and what that might mean. I want to put that picture up of Korean Peninsula if you can do it. Except for my wife and family, that, that is my favorite photo. Uh, it, it says it all. Uh, there's the south of the demilitarized zone, the uh, same people as north, same resources north and south. And the big difference is in the south, it's a free political system and a free economic system. And there's. <laughs> I'm a conservative. I tend not to want to waste money. What's wrong with, what's wrong with this one? There, there, there'd only be less light in the north, that's all. That dot of light is Pyongyang, and, uh, and the people there are starving, and uh, their growth is stunted, and it's a, it's a shame. It's a, it's a tragedy. And, uh, what good are sanctions going to do if the country is already in such dire straits and the regime appears to be only concerned about perpetuating its uh, its regime? Most dictatorial regimes care only about perpetuating themselves in power. That, that is, when they get up in the morning, that's what they worry about. They don't worry about their people. They don't worry about elections. They don't worry about a free press. They don't worry about all the things that, that people worry about in a democracy. Uh, but. Uh, my question is, what good will sanctions do for that regime? Well, time will tell. And uh, we'll have to see the extent to which the international community decides that they don't want a world with more nuclear powers. They don't want to lower the nuclear threshold. Uh, they don't want to run the risk of having weapons of mass destruction find their way into the hands of uh, non-state entities uh, and terrorist groups. And, uh, and, and that only by cooperating and, and a cohesive approach to a problem like this, uh, is the world going to be able to deal with it effectively? And I suspect that it is possible for, for sufficient uh, pressure to be marshaled to deal with it. Uh, but it, it will take a, a lot of, it will take a relatively common threat assessment, uh, assessment of, the, of our, the world's circumstance on the part of other countries. It will take a willingness on the part of other countries to forego commercial opportunities in exchange for security interests. And, and it, it will require all, all the international community of free nations to um, decide that, that action during this period when the threat is not immediate is the time to do it rather than when the threat becomes more immediate in, in whatever number of years that may be. So I, I'm, I'm very, I, I'm strongly supportive of what the president's doing. I think he's, he's, he's working this very hard. He cares deeply about it and uh, is on the right track. Mr. Secretary? Yes. Um, you've made it very clear that the commanders in Iraq get what they need, have gotten. Within what reason. Okay. I mean, but, don't but commit you, me into the future. Okay, but, but you, you, you've made that clear. The president today said if General Casey uh, wants to make any changes in strategy that, that you will support him. So my question is, do you bear any responsibility for what has gone wrong in Iraq, or is it all General Casey's fault? Oh, this is a question that gets asked every time there's a press conference. You know, give me all your sevens. Tell us what you've done wrong. Why do we have to keep going through this? Of course I bear responsibility. My Lord, I'm Secretary of Defense. Write it down. Quote it. You can bank it. Yes. But you're saying yes. the, stra the strategy is one that, that, uh, that, that, that the generals in, in Iraq get what they want, that, uh, you know, it's up we to them if they want recommend. more money. We, we recommend, okay? You recommend we us. recommend. Is, is it your the job to challenge those recommendations, or are they just accepted? I, I, <laughs> I would say we get pretty good questions uh, when, when we come in with things. So uh, I, I feel well supervised by my civilian leadership. I know that's a disappointment for you, but <laughs> no, <it's laughs> Jim. Uh, General, do you need more troops in Iraq than you have now? Uh, I don't. Right now, my answer is no, but 
we're continuing to work things back there, and, and is, if I think I need more, I'll, I'll ask for more and bring more in. If the violence continues to increase at, at, at the rate it is now, do you think that that's something it, it, that yeah, you'll it, it's, have to it's work really it, it, it's a tough nut. Whether or not bringing in more troops, more U.S. troops, uh, will have a significant long-term impact on the violence. There's no question locally more troops will have some effect on the levels of violence. But whether more U.S. troops for a sustained period will get us where we're going faster is an open question, and that's part of the calculations that I make as I go through this. But it's Jen, not Jen, an easy calculation. It's a tough one. It's, there's no guidebook where you get up in the morning and look in the guidebook on Chapter 7, page 6, that tells you how to do this. And, and General Casey and his team work, work through it. They work through it with... General Abizade, they work through it with the chiefs, joint chiefs, they work with it with General Pace and Ed Giambastiani. They then come in and brief me and, and uh, the senior civilian team, and then we brief the president and work with him. It is, it, is, uh, it is getting enormous attention, and there is no roadmap. It is tough stuff. And in my view, uh, General Casey's doing a terrific job. Thanks a lot, folks.